You know, um, John, when he had called and asked me if I would share this morning, you know, and I, I had thought about it. <clears throat> well, actually, it's the youth group that really inspired this and birthed this message in the first place. And so I visited with John, and uh, I started digging a hole. And I uh, asked him, asked him, well, how about if I just do the cruise and you stay here and preach? The tree never got planted, it just got buried back in. So that was good. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. So anyway, um, <clears throat> what I'm praying to, it's just, uh, to share this morning is, uh, it's going to be scriptures you've heard, it's going to be you know, that's what God has been doing in my heart and my whole life is just taking scriptures that I've stood on for so long and, and the way they've been taught and everything to me and showing me more in depth, more of, you know, of my, my life and how I'm going to get stronger and how things are going to, you know, just how we are going to be history makers. You know, and I've taken that song and it's that I'm going to be, I am. You know, I am a history maker. I am one who speaks the truth to others. And so, just what I ask right now, that, that Lord, that he just envelops this place, envelops our hearts and our minds, and, and even as it was spoken of the, the double witness, that yes, the word will go out this morning, but it's up to us to take it home. It's up to us to take it home and look at it and apply it to our lives every single day. And not just one day or for one moment, it's, it's for always. His word is for always and it is eternity. Everything he created and everything he did was for eternity and for all of us to be together with him. And so, Father, I just want to thank you right now as you just, you, you just touch my heart, Father. Remove anything that is of me, and Lord, because we just want you. You're the only one who has anything to say that's, that's going to reach our hearts and it's going to change our lives that we are history makers and we are those who speak the truth and we are those who will stand and run for the gospel. And Father, we just thank you right now. Amen. Praise God. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, um, Tammy had asked, actually asked Leah and uh, my wife and I, Leah, to um, share with the youth group for a couple weeks on um, love. It was Valentine's and, you know, and it was a way that she wanted to reach them you know, and just kind of share some things with them and and so, you know, before thinking, just said, sure. <laughs> then we drove, drove home going, what did we just do? And because kids, youth, <laughs> they're different to speak with, you know. They're, they're tough on you, you know, because they want the truth. That's what, that's what you know. And um, so as I was looking at, you know, kind of the idea of what Tammy was, was uh, wanting to share and kind of, you know, do and everything. I said, God, it's before you. What do you want me to do? And he started showing me what I'll be sharing today and started showing me that and showing me that. And the more he showed me this, the more I thought, this isn't just for the youth. This is for everybody. You know, this isn't just a focus on, you know, this age group. Or this is from beginning to end, you know, what you're sharing and giving to me. And so when pastor asked me, it was like, okay, there's a reason and a purpose for everything, and I just want to follow my father. So if you go to Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> I'll start with verse 1 there. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, <clears throat> he was afterward hungered. It says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And then I'd like to just jump to another scripture real quick. You don't have to go there. Uh, you can just write it down. In Hebrews 4.15 we read, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so you take those two verses and you look at that first one. And my question is to you, how many of you have been tempted to turn stones to bread? How many of you have been taken to a high mountaintop? You know, and told, hey, cast yourself down, the angels will catch you. You know, or I'm going to show you the kingdoms of the world and I will give them to you. 
And I'm sh hope, sure if, you know, because I know I have not been tempted that way. <laughs> and so, you know, you take these two scriptures, and, and so our, our automatic thinking is to look at what it says, that he's been tempted in all ways, like as we have, and we take that and we look at it like, okay, how have I been tempted? So this is the way he's been tempted. <clears throat> so we look at all the things in our lives, you know, whether we've, you know, have been with Christ all our life, or we just became new, you know, we've had a rough past, you know, in drinking, drugs, what, you know, everything, you know, many partners, the whole thing, you know, we look at that and say, okay, he's been tempted in all those ways, because it says, it says right here, like as we are, and they even had a movie come out, it's called The Temptation of Christ, never watched it, heard things about it, that's why I never watched it. Because, you know, this is a place where we step off. Because we want to we wanna relate everything from the way we think and put it into Jesus. And so this is how he walked this earth. You know? And this is the things he was tempted with. And these are the things that brought him down. These are the things he was destroyed with, you know. And so the Lord started showing me these things. And so I put down, it's, my thought is today, and this will be a title too, it says it's not the what, it's the why. And it's focusing on why. You know, because we automatically, again, because we're in a world of touch, feel, the five senses, you know, we want to, that's how everything we work with. But in the spirit realm, we got to know that it, is not, it does not work that way. And so we want to relate in what we touch, what we feel, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, and how, you know, and how we're being tempted. And so that's the things we put in place there. It's not the what, it's the why. And so if we go over to Matthew 19, <clears throat> 16 through 26, and it says, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? We, all, we know the story of the young ruler who came, and he came, and he came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to have eternal life? And he said unto him, what's his first words to him, he says, why do you call me good? There is only one that is good, and that is my Father, God. You know, and I've always looked at that and thought, why did he throw that in there when this young man came asking, yo, what must I do? Have you, yo, we would, well, this is a thing you need to do, but his first words are... Why do you call me good? And you're going to see as I go through this why he said this. He says, there's none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. So why call me good? Because Jesus walked this earth with the thought, there's only one opinion that matters of me, and that's my father's. And when you come and call me good, that's your opinion. But the opinion that's going to run my life is my father's. The one that looks at me the way I truly am is what matters is how I'm going to walk this earth and how I'm going to be in this earth. And so he says unto him after that, and he says unto him, which, and Jesus told him, you don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, I'll honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, oh, I've done all these things, I've kept them all from my youth. And so what yet I lack? And he says, if you will be perfect, or if you want to be whole, go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, follow me. And the young ruler's first thought was, I have great possessions. How can you say to get rid of that? And if you look, follow the mindset of what this young ruler was saying, and the mindset of what Jesus was saying, it, it wasn't necessarily, and I might step on some toes, it wasn't necessarily go and get rid of your stuff. That's the only way you're going to be whole. What he was looking at was this young man his whole personality laid in his possessions, which then became his greatest possession was himself. 
And that is the battle we will walk through this life. Whose possession are you? Are you your possession? Are you your friend's possession? Are you those who say things, speak things into your life? Unless they are of God, <laughs> truly of God. Are those the things that possess you? Because that's what we do. We walk through this life letting others possess us by the words that they speak into our lives. And the only one we're really not listening to is our Father, who is the only opinion that matters. The only opinion that matters. And so he had this battle. And great possession means to acquire, to obtain by my own means. So my greatest possession, unless I give it to my Father, is me. And I would rather walk this earth being my Father's greatest possession. I want to be His greatest possession. I want to step out of this, and I don't want to be sad because I have to lay down pride, because I have to lay down the things that I want or the things I think will make me happy, or the things I think will make you or anybody else happy. Because there's an automatic thing to this, is that if we are God's greatest possession, and we walk in that, in that way, guess what? Yeah, there's, other, there's going to be those who are going to be upset at us. There's going to be those who are going to reject us. But then there's also those who are going to receive what we have, and what we have is the greatest possession, that is God, that is Christ, that is the Holy Ghost. As Pastor John says, all my teddy bears are on the bed. <laughs> you had to be here for that one. <clears throat> and so, you know, so that great possession, obtain those things, is self-dignity. It's what other th people think. You know, this young man was thinking, well, this is my dignity. This is my, what people think of me I, because I'm, I'm important. And without my wealth, I'm not important no more. And Jesus is saying, all I want you to do is get rid of the possession of yourself. That's all. You know, and in, in ways, once we get rid of that, yeah, we, will, we can sell everything we have. And it won't matter. But the greatest thing he wanted him to sell was himself. Get rid of yourself. Get rid of yourself and follow me. And that's an easy, and, that, and then it becomes easier. <clears throat> And so it said unto Jesus, the disciples says, well, as we say unto you that a rich man shall heart, and then he said unto the disciples, it's, hardly, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they just said, so who's going to get saved? What's left? You know, if we got to get rid of, everybody has to get rid of everything, who's going to be saved? Who's going to get into the kingdom of heaven? You know, this is, this is a regulation we haven't heard about yet. You know, what were they thinking? They were thinking with their mind. They were thinking of the things that they had. They were thinking of that wonderful fishing boat they had, the nets, and those things that they made their living with. And if I get rid of all that, who am I anymore? Who am I? You know, because it's these things that say who I am. My possessions, the great possessions, because they say who I am. And Jesus said unto them, and, and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, with men it's impossible. But with God all things are possible. And I, and I wrote down, receiving man's image of ourself is impossible. But receiving God's image of ourself, then all things are possible. If we walk in the image of what God has sees us as, and that's been my greatest desire, and that's the word I go out and I speak, that's the thing I run with. That's the truth he's laid in my heart. He's going to lay different truths in other people's hearts. But as a body, we work together to bring a truth to the people of this world that need it, that are being possessed by things that, you know, by themselves, by who they, you know, what other people are saying about them, by, you know, they're qualifying themselves by other things and not by the Word of God and not by what God says to us and who we are. You know, and, and I say it over and over. That's why I'm His favorite. I am His favorite. 
because I want to be his greatest possession. And he says, I don't have to work for it. The possessions of this world, I have to work for. But to be his possession, his greatest possession, I don't have to work for. I can walk in it. I can live into, in it. <clears throat> so let me bring that, uh, another part of that scripture. That's, this scripture, I've read this so many times and so many things. That's why I mean, he, he delves more and more when he shows the possessions. And in verse 17 of that, it says, And he said unto him, Why call me good? There is none good but the Father. But if you will enter into life, and I just stuck on me. I thought, hold on here. But if you will enter life, the only way you're going to really know what life is like is to get rid of the greatest possession in your life, and that's you. If you really want life, what does life? Life means to arise, come into existence, begin to be. Entrance into a condition, state of things. Begin to be. If you want to begin to be, if you want to go into a state of condition where there is abundant joy, where there is a flowing, a river coming out of you to others, where you can bring truth into a room, where you can bring joy into a room, where you bring your Father, because your greatest possession is Him. Bringing that into the room, because what you have, what I have, other than that, is nothing, means nothing. We'll take nobody anywhere. It might advance them somewhere on this earth, but what good is that when eternity shows up? What good is it? So come into this life, if you will Enter this life. Jesus was speaking to this young man. If you enter this life, it's a precious, precious thing. And in Matthew 16, 15 through 18, and he says to, unto them, Who do they say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father has revealed this to you, and upon this is what, I am is what I'm going to build my church, upon this rock, upon this foundation that you aren't listening to what the flesh and blood are telling you. You're listening to what my Father is telling you. That's the rock I want to build my church upon. That is what I want to build my church upon. Not how big the church is, not how many people are in it, but how many people who want to really live for Christ, who want to live for their Father, whose greatest possession is being obedient. The greatest possession of all is being obedient and not having, you know, People who come in and talk to you and say, well, you know, da 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 da, and, and automatically we want to. Okay, well, to get better in their eyes, no. Because if we're already, if we're, if we're in God's eyes and we're walking for Him, and that's one thing He laid on my heart as I, as I studied on, because, you know, He says, I will give you the desires of your heart. I'll give you the desires of your heart. And I thought, God, what's your desire? That's what I want to do. I want to give you the desires of your heart. And He said, to give me the desires of my heart is to love me and to walk with me, and then everything else will follow. Everything else comes with it. It's so interesting when you start doing this, and all the scriptures start clicking together. Seek ye, for you, seek ye first the kingdom, and all these other things will be added on. But if you seek me first, and I become your greatest possession, everything else that you worry about is taken care of. Done. Done. You don't have to get up in the morning and wonder if you're going to qualify for work today or if you're going to qualify for in somebody else's eyesight because you're already qualified. You're already the greatest, the creator of this earth, the universe. You're already his favorite, and you get up, and you walk in that favoritism. You walk in that all day long, and the other things don't mean nothing. They don't mean anything anymore because the only thing that matters is God. 
and his opinion of you. And if you take the time, here's another one of them false words, those false phrases. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. If you are really heavenly minded, you're the best thing for this earth. If you are really heavenly minded, and that's taking the time to find out what, what God's, his thinking, his thoughts, his love for you. How, how much he cares for this earth. And I, I hope somebody calls me that. Because I'll say, you know, I want to be the, I'm the greatest thing for this earth because I am heavenly minded. I am about my father's business. That's how I want to walk this earth, being about my father's business. And so call me heavenly minded. It's a compliment to me. You know, if we walk in the heavenly mindedness of this world, yeah, I'm no good. But if I'm in the heavenly mindedness of my Father, I am the greatest thing, and so are you, to this earth. Amen. The greatest thing to this earth. And so, he says, I'll build this rock, this foundation. See, what my Father says, what the Spirit says is all there is. So you can't fail on that foundation. There's no failure in that foundation. There is no failure there. And we walk, we walk every day, every moment, you know, am I going to fail today? Am I going to mess up somehow? Am I not going to be right for this? And, you know, am I, you know, you know, it's not about a haughtiness. It's about a true godly walk. Because Jesus walked a true godly walk. He was heavenly minded. Nobody called him haughty. Nobody called him, oh, you think you're so good? Yo, know, he went about doing good. He went about healing people. They tried to kill him for that. Galatians 1, 15, 17. It says, but when, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately, Paul says, I conferred not, with blood and flesh. Immediately, I did not confer with blood and flesh. And then he even goes on and says, neither went up to Jerusalem where the apostles were and asked their opinion. We have a personal walk with God. And that walk and that relationship comes with spending time with Him. We get edifying words from those you know, around us. You know, there's those that I truly let speak into my life because I know they're speaking truth. I know they're speaking of what God is saying. And there's those I don't want to speak in my life, you know? But to know, to know that, you know, you got to be like Paul. You know, when something comes at you, don't immediately confer with the flesh or, the, you know, those things of this earth and he says, I immediately didn't do that. But I conferred in my heavenly father because it was 15 years, 14, 15 years before he really got out there. Paul, he spent all that time with the father. He spent that time wanting to know. You know, God speaking to him. You know, this is the walk I want to make. This is the walk I want to have. How am I going to, you know, change people's lives without you? How do I change their lives? He changed their lives before by killing them. And he knew that wasn't the right way, you know. That's kind of forcing the hand. You know, and that was his battle. And I've, I've spoken this before. You know, in my heart, I know his battle, his thorn, was the guilt of all them people he killed. And then God saving him? He couldn't handle that. He could not understand. And it just terrorized him and it controlled him and it was the opinion of himself that kept him from walking the way god wanted and finally jesus said after three times he said why isn't my grace enough isn't the power grace is power from god isn't the power that i am instilling into you enough that you've been covered. These things are covered. Your past means nothing. You know what it means, anything? 
my opinion of you. And that's it. Yours is null and void. Yours means nothing. Yours, because it's of man, because it's of flesh and blood, leads to death. But it is the Spirit that brings life. And if you want life, if you want to enter this life, who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to have life? Are you going to have life? Are you going to walk in that life? Who are you going to listen to day in, day out? And that's an important thing for us to walk as history makers, truth speakers. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, which ye, which ye which are spiritual, and if you're spiritual, you've been walking with God, you've entered this life. That's my phrase. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest you be tempted. There's that warning. Even though we receive him, we walk in him, that is always there to pull you back out. It's always there. It's a battle. I know Paul said he had a warring in his inside. You know, what I want to do, I don't want to do. What I do, I do. You know, da, 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 da. you know it's, it was one of those scriptures you just kind of looked at a few times. What is he saying? You know? When I want to walk with the Father, the flesh is going to battle me every day. It's going to battle you. It don't like the Spirit. It don't like that world. Your flesh knows it's going to die. It has an end, but your spirit does not. If you will enter this life, you see, it's not, it's not about the what, it's the why. <laughs> it's the why. Considering yourself, lest you be tempted. Considering means to be with wide open eyes. An earnest, but more continued inspection. Taking heed and looking at. You know, and when you're helping your brother or sister, don't look at their faults. Look at what God has done for you, brought you into this place, let you walk in this real life and this joy, and you impart that with meekness into your brother or sister, that's why it's important for us to walk that life. That's why it's important for us to forget about who we are because it's the only thing that's going to help that brother or sister or that person out in the street is God, is His Spirit, is being heavenly minded. To speak those words of truth. That's how you're going to change history. And it still ain't about you, because when they come up to you and say, oh, you're so good, why do you call me good? I have done nothing to earn this. I have done nothing for the Spirit to reside in me, except say, yes, Lord. <laughs> I want to live for you. That's all I, that's the only part I have in this whole thing. And it's so small. And meaningless, that's the best thing for me, that it is. Because if it wasn't, I would start, you know, well, okay, maybe I did do something. Gone. You know, gone. I'm starting to have an opinion about myself. Whew. Bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, you feel the law of Christ. <laughs> and you're not going to bear their burdens unless your burdens aren't bear, bearing down on you. Because pity parties start, you know, and the oh, woe is me. You know, and, and well, you know, I remember that too. You know, and it's, that's not what people need to hear. They don't need to be drugged back in and, and be consoled by the flesh. They need to be consoled by the Spirit. That's what brings life. You want to enter this life? Sell your possessions because it ain't about the what. It's the why. And so he goes on to three. Isn't this clear? For if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Well, he makes it clear. 
You're just deceiving yourself to even think that way, that you're something. Whose opinion are you listening to? Whose opinion are you walking in? Whose strength, whose power, whose grace has been imparted into you that you can walk this life? Enjoy no matter what's going on. Counting it as all joy. I'm really grasping on to some of the stuff Paul said. You know, because at first, you know, first you're looking at that, yeah, sure, you're Paul. You know? <laughs> you know? And because Paul didn't think of himself as Paul, he thought of himself as being, you know, empowered by Christ. Yeah, That's why. Yeah. That's that mind thought. That's where we got to change. That's where that whole thing comes in. So what about Jesus? Tempted in every way that we have. Every single day, he got up and got bombarded. You're the Messiah. Kill the Romans and we're going to have our own government. Because you're the Messiah. You're God's son. So we're going to kill these people and become the new rulers. And it's like, really? When you start thinking the mindset, you do, you look at this stuff and going, really? You know, but we thought the same thing. Now that I have Christ in me, <laughs> you know, I have Christ in me, you know, I'm good. No. You know, and then on the opposite round, we had the other group coming in. You call yourself the Messiah, you blasphemer? We're going to kill you. So every day, how was he tempted as us? He was challenged every day, being told who he was or who he wasn't to get him off track. That is the greatest plan of the enemy. All I got to do is put a thought in your mind and get the opinion of God out of you of who you are. That's all I have to do. And we talk about the battle, the wages in the mind, yo, know, my thoughts and, you know. And so it was really, you know, you look at every time that, you know, any time he came, Peter came, you know, and he says, I'm going to be, I will be crucified. And, and Peter's like, no, you're not. Uh-uh. Not if I have anything to say about it. Satan, get thee behind me. Don't try and give me an opinion of who I am or who I'm not. Because there's only one opinion that matters, and that's my father's. One opinion that matters, and that's my father's. So anything you come at me with, try and say I'm good, try and tear me down, it don't matter. There's only one good. Only one that is good. And he's the good one who's going to get me through all of this. His only words. He listened to the only words he listened to was his father's. And, 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 and that's why it was so hard when he went to the cross. That's why it was so hard when his father turned his back. That was the only time he felt separation. The only time. And look how he cried out. We cry out. <laughs> I don't even have to finish that. When do we cry out? Because our God said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Never. What's your opinion of yourself? It's not the what's in your life, it's the why. So let me take you back to the beginning where it all began. Genesis 1, 26, 28. His greatest gift and God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish, the fowl, cattle, over, the, over the, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Dominion means just to prevail against. Doesn't mean you have to go out and kill it. Just prevail. And how do you do that? Because we made you 
in our image. Why do we war? Because we step outside the image that we were created to be. We were created to be like them, like God. And so to step outside that image, we war, we battle. We step outside that, we start hearing all the other opinions. It's when we stay in the image we were created to be that we, the, the opinion of God is what matters. The opinion of God is what comes into our heart. The opinion of God is what drives us daily. The opinion of God is what makes us that we can speak into other people's lives because it's the opinion of God and not ours or some theory we thought of. You know, that's why Paul said, don't listen to other gospels. There's only one true gospel, one, and it is truth. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. And so, yeah, he kind of, kind of repeated himself. I think there was something going on here. Can, did you hear me? In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth with people like us. In the same image, because there's going to be so many people out there outside the image that are doing all the things of the world, trying to satisfy what God made us for in the first place. And they run their lives with the opinion of everything else except the most important one. I've created you in my image. Wow, that's it. I'm going to walk in that image. You see, outside of his image we were created for, there's restlessness, you're not satisfied, there's deceit, and there's no real joy. And, if you, and, and like I said, unless you've walked with the Lord and heard those other things, which is great, you know, I've heard, I've heard people say, oh, you got such a great testimony. My great testimony started today. I received Christ in my heart. That's my greatest testimony right there. You know, I overcome by the words of my testimony and the blood of the Lamb. I don't overcome because, you know, as I shared with the kids, I said, you know, I could tell you about all the drugs being shot at, you know, all this stuff I did in my life, but is that going to save you? Is that going to bring truth into your life? What they need to hear is truth. What they need to hear is the word of God speaking into their lives, saying you have a different way to go here. You have a, an image that you were created for in the beginning. You didn't just become that. You were already that in the beginning. It was the infilling. You know, it's kind of like, okay, the vessel I've created. I'm the potter. I've made this vessel. Now we're going to fill it. with the Holy Ghost. And when we ask Him into our hearts, that's what happens. It completes. It completes what it was first created to be. So it's not about people liking us. It's about people liking themselves in the image of Christ. And so that's why it's not about the what. It's about the why. Because we bring the why to them. Why? Why? Because you need to learn to like yourself in Christ. You need to learn that how much he loves you, how far he went and is going to go to hold you, to love you, to keep you in the image that you first were created for, to walk in that image. So it's liking themselves, and that comes when we do not confer with the flesh, but we confer with in the Spirit, and bring that word to these people. Bring that to them. And I, this all ties, you know, Marty, we started sharing your testimony of your daughter, and you know, a lot of you know about our daughter. And this week, you know, and that's, you know, <laughs> um, if, if those of you don't know, she has Crohn's really bad. And anyway, um, so Monday we get a call. 
and it's testimony. You know, she had, well, she had an infusion last Friday, a week ago Friday. Monday morning we get a call, and of course, they, she has infusions every six weeks, and they're not cheap. And it just piles and piles and piles, and where she works, her insurance that she has is usually gone within the first month of, you know, it renews every year while well, it's gone the first month. And so it's piled and piled, and, and she, she cried out to, to the head of this hospital down there. You know, we have to let our requests be known sometimes, or all the time, really. And uh, he had already helped her with these infusions, and uh, the, the bills had collected up to 50-some thousand dollars. You know, we can only do so much. <laughs> and... Uh, and she let it be known, and this, this doctor got her on a program. There's this lady who works with these things. Anyway, so she applied. She calls. They paid everything off. Paid all that off. So we were like, yo, dancing. And then Thursday, she calls me at work, and she's just crying. You know, just say, Dad, I feel like somebody's stabbing me in the stomach over and over. And I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, Dad, don't confer with flesh and blood here. The only thing that's going to help her, she's in Florida. I can't be there. So I have to confer in the Spirit. And it's like, honey, you know, God's not going to leave you. You know, and if you really know how God feels about you, you can say that with so much power and truth. And, and, and when the person on the other end knows, they can start receiving that. And so I stayed with her. She, uh, the friend of hers was going to come and pick her up to take her to the hospital. And I remember, you know, she said, okay, I'm gonna be, I'll be all right. They were there to get her. So I hung up, and I remember saying, Dad, this is my daughter. You know, I can't be there, but you will. You will be there. This is my daughter, you know? And you start really <laughs> grasping on to things. So much more. So they took her in and things, you know, she's doing a lot better. But she called back. And this is the part that conferring in the spirit really helps. She called back. She was in the bathroom. This she told us afterwards. She told us she was sitting in the bathroom, and she was just doubled over in pain. And this lady comes walking in. She doesn't even know. And she says, how are you? She goes, are you okay? And our daughter, she's one of those, I'm okay. I'll be okay. And the lady goes, can I pray for you? And the old Chris Tara's like, yes, you know, please. And she starts praying with her. So... Thank you, Dad. You heard my cry. Her manager walks in, who has literally told her times when she needs to go in for a fusion, she can't, she has to work. I mean, you know, or, you know, okay, go get your infusion, but come back to work. You know, and that's, that's not easy. <laughs> she comes in, she steps in the door, sees what's happening, and breaks down crying right there. And... She said the next day at work, her manager was a total change in her. How do you argue with that? How can you accept the opinion of man in that situation or what is going on, what the Father is doing? Because as I looked at that, I said, okay. He said, Rick, I had, I had things to do. Your daughter was taken care of. But I had this other person I need to touch too. I said, really, her coming in with her? He goes, Rick, you don't know that, yeah, your daughter, and there was a lady there touching her, praying over her, but when that other lady walked in, she saw angels. And that's what changed her heart. And that's what's going to change her heart for me. Because it ain't flesh and blood that's going to change things. It's, it's the Spirit. It's the truth of the Spirit that's going to change things. And, you know, you know, my daughter, she received, you know, her healing there and her comfort, but yet somebody else received, you know, a heart change in the same time. 
You know, and we could focus on, oh, why me, me? You know, why, why did my daughter have to go through this? I could go there. But he's showing me, Rick, that there's no reason to. And that's why he says, you know, it's not about the what, it's the why. It's the why. Because I want you all here with me. You know, and, and if you go to John 11, I'm going to finish with this, 39 through 42. And I said, Lord, what do, you, what do you really want here? And he says, this is what I want. He said, Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha and the sister of him that was dead, and says unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks. <laughs> For he has been dead four days. And Jesus says unto her, said I not unto you, if you would believe, you will see the glory of God. She was believing in flesh and blood. He said, I said, believe in my spirit. Believe in the resurrection power. Believe in what brings life and joy to other people's lives. You see, it, it wasn't about the what. Then they looked, took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus slipped over his side. <laughs> Father, I thank you. You and me had this already done before I even got here but I'm doing this for them. He said, this is, this, is, this is the relationship we're going to have. It's already done. It's for them. The why. It's the why. We need to look at it, and that's why what can't show up. <laughs> what can't show up? My possessions can't show up. My brilliant thinking can't show up. Only the Spirit has to show up. And I'm the willing vessel to carry him there, to let him work, to let him do what he does. You know, at the wedding, he changed the water into wine. And when we become obedient, and when we become the mouthpiece of God, and our opinions mean nothing, and only his is, we become the waters that's been changed to wine, and people go, I've never tasted this before. This is rich. We've never had anything this pure. And that's what, that's what we're all about, yeah. is bringing a pure word to the world, bringing a pure word of, you know, it's about what God thinks about you is all that matters. Amen. Father, <laughs> you can even just in your own heart know where you're at you know where you're at and if you allow God he'll show you where you're at and if you're getting the right picture you're in his lap pushed back against his chest you know John really had it together you know and he was with the beloved and the beloved was in his chest John had a picture you know, pastor talks, you know, and, and our, our thoughts and our, you know, there's imagination and there's a, an imagination that reaches that place to where the Spirit can work. And Father, so I just pray for everyone here, Lord, that as we walk out that door and even as spoken before, take it home and chew on it. Take it home and just sit in there and let the Spirit Keep bringing back and bringing back. And it's that time that you spend. You know, he says, come sit, reason with me. Because I just want to tell you how good you are. I want to tell you how awesome you are. I want to tell you that you're my favorite. That I love you. I love you. Because you're my vessel. You're my vessel that I have changed. You're the new wine bottle. Because that old stuff has no place no more. And I would just say, in your heart today, in your heart, not of your opinion, not of your thinking, but of God's and of the Spirit, that that change comes, that, that you start walking from this time forward, receiving His love, receiving His grace, His empowerment, 
that what was before is no more. And as Paul says, I go towards the mark. I don't look back no more. They had it together. When you start grasping onto these things, you start really understanding what they were saying when they said them. Because that holds me back when I have an opinion of myself, but your opinion takes me forward. Your opinion means everything. And I just ask that you bring that into your heart. Bring that into your everyday walk. And from this day, you are a history maker. You are a truth speaker. And I just thank God, and I look to Him and I say, it's already done. Because I know you told me. And we talked this out. And so from this place we walk. And we walk in that spirit. Because it's for those out there that need Jesus. Amen. Thank you.